Good morning. Are you happy to be here today? I'm certainly thrilled and honored and privileged to be with you today, a part of this assembly of the saints for yet again another period of worship to him who created us. I want to wish all of you a happy Memorial Day. This is a weekend in which many Americans travel to partake in some kind of activity which brings them pleasure. And so I say thank you to all of those who have fought for us to make that possibility a reality. As we remember and memorialize what has been done in battle for our freedom, and as we have memorialized the possibility and the reality of our spiritual freedom and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, I want us to think about this morning some similarities that we find between the church and a battle scenario. You know, there are many different similarities we can consider if you think about a battle situation between that and the church. Today, I want us to focus on three. You may have asked the question at some point in your life or maybe if you didn't ask it, you have wondered within yourself about the church. Well, what's in it for me? You say, well, preacher, that doesn't sound like a very good attitude for a person to have to to think about what the church has to offer for me. But the truth of the matter is that if the church doesn't have anything to offer us, then there's no uh, motivation for us to be a part of it, is there? And so let's think today about what the church has to offer for each of us as members of it. The text that we read, that that Michael read for us from Acts chapter two, we'll come back to it a little bit later, but really in that text, we have a very vivid description and a, a great picture of the early church. And we see what the early church had to offer for those individuals who were a part of it. And friends, today, don't think because we are some 2,000 years removed that we're not a part of the same church because that church which was established and founded by the death of Christ that began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two is the very same church that we are a part of today. And so the benefits and the blessings that we see the church in the first century offering to those Christians are the same benefits and the same blessings that the church has to offer us today. And it ought to thrill your soul to know that the church indeed has something to offer for you. Ultimately, in the church, we know and we understand that we find freedom, that we find salvation in and through the church. But how this happens and the the, the specific details about it are very interesting, especially when we think about it and compare it to, as I said, this battle situation. So as we contemplate Memorial Day and we consider what is in the church for all of us, think with me about the fact, first of all, that the church is a boot camp for soldiers. Have you ever thought about it like that? The church is a boot camp for soldiers. Now, boot camp, of course, if you've ever been there, you understand is for training. And sometimes people go in relatively unfit and unaware, really, But you know, when they come out of that boot camp, they're what we might call fit as a fiddle. They are aware of the seriousness of the task with which they have been entrusted. And just as the the boot camp for our military today is like that, the church is a boot camp for soldiers in the church. The church trains soldiers in a battle that we're fighting against Satan. And it needs those who are both serious about that task and those who are fit for the task. As such, the church is training, number one, soldiers who minister to the needs of others. You think about how the military works and it's set up where people are helping each other. It's not something where one person can go into a battle situation and declare the victory and win the victory. And the same is true in the spiritual battle that we're facing. You cannot do it alone. Yes, I understand you need the help of God, you need the help of Jesus, you need the help of the Holy Spirit, but really we need the help of each other to win this battle that we're in against Satan. And the church is set up in that way. 
It's a part of Christianity. Christianity is a religion of help and, and one where there's always to be a sense of community. We are interdependent of one another as Christians. We see a good illustration and an example of that in Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2 and we'll begin reading in verse 25 this morning. There in Philippians chapter 2 is, is Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. He mentions a, a very interesting individual who apparently was a good helper. A, a person who was willing to go above and beyond what was required of him to see that he was helping others and ministering to their needs. His name, Epaphroditus. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 25. There Paul says, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Now that's interesting that he doesn't just stop and say, well, church, here this man Epaphroditus is and he's helped you, he's ministered to your needs. Albeit that might have been the case, Paul doesn't begin there. He says, Epaphroditus has ministered to my needs. And as great and as powerful a preacher as the Apostle Paul was, we see time and time again where he needed folks to help him. He needed folks to minister to his needs. And that's what Epaphroditus did for him. Verse 26 says that since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. And so there was a reciprocal kind of care here between Epaphroditus and even the church in Philippi. But in verse 27, we see, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him, you may rejoice and be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, and then the very last statement in that paragraph, we see why Epaphroditus did this. To supply what was lacking in your service toward me. And so again, Epaphroditus was one of these soldiers who had been in this boot camp we're talking about where they were trained to minister to the needs of others. I hope that you in your time in the church are learning to help each other to minister to one another's needs. Well, number two, as such, the church is training soldiers who will fight against evil. Yes, it's important to have those who minister to the needs of others, but my, how important it is to have those who fight against evil. You know, the military, I imagine, I've never been a part of the military, but I don't imagine the military would take too kindly to a person who is unwilling to fight against evil forces. Isn't that supposed to be the purpose of our military, to, to fight against those evil forces who want to cause us harm, to protect us? The military is not going to accept a person who doesn't fight against evil forces. As a matter of fact, I believe serious action would probably be taken against one who wouldn't stand up and fight in the name of our country against those evil forces. But you see, in the church sometimes... That's what is happening. Sometimes in the church, we're not fighting against the evil forces. We're not fighting against Satan, who, as we talked about this morning, is like that roaring lion who's walking about seeking whom he may devour. You know, Satan is always prepared. He's always ready at, to strike at a moment's notice, just like this. He's ready. That's why we're, we are told Likewise, to always be ready. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15 that inasmuch as in him was, he was ready to go and preach the gospel. And then we come down to 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 where Peter encourages the Christians to be ready always to give an answer to those who ask a reason of our hope. And those are just two examples, but boy, we need to be ready, ready to fight against the forces of evil. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, just before Paul goes in and, and begins to list 
those pieces of armor, the Christian armor in each of those pieces. Listen to what he says beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That sounds like a daunting task, doesn't it? To be fighting in a battle against these people, the principalities, the powers, the hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's why Paul says to strap up, put your armor on, and be ready to go into battle. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. In the church, we are trying to prepare you and to equip you to fight this battle against Satan. We can't do it for you. We can't help you completely and fully. You have to rely on God. God has promised that he will never leave us, never forsake us, and that he is there to help us. That's Hebrews 13 and verse 5. So this is all a matter of preparation. Just like a boot camp prepares soldiers for battle, the church is a training ground for saints in the fight against evil. Well, not only is the church training soldiers who minister to the needs of others, not only is it training soldiers who will fight against evil, but it's training soldiers who will fight despite their circumstances. That's important in military, isn't it? To be able to go to battle at a moment's notice, regardless of your circumstances, and it's just as important in our spiritual battle. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Paul says this, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's just part and parcel of being a Christian, to endure hardships. As a matter of fact, great length was taken to warn us and to, to be sure that we understand that when we sign up for this battle, hardships will come. You can just count on it. It's, it's going to happen. Then in verse 4 he says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. We ought not to be concerned so much about our physical circumstances, the, the things that, that draw us away from battle. If we, if we entangle ourselves with those things, God's not well pleased with us. Our entire focus ought to be fighting this battle against these evil forces. You see, when something of the world draws our attention away from the battle we're engaged in, again, he's not pleased with us. And so no matter what circumstances we face, we always need to be ready and willing to fight the battle, to stand strong in the power of his might. It's nothing that I do of my own, nothing that you do of your own, nothing that we do collectively necessarily. That's why he said to stand strong in the power of God's might and God will fight with us and for us. So the church is a boot camp for soldiers. Number two, the church is a battlefield hospital. It's a boot camp for soldiers, but it's a battlefield hospital. As important as it is to have soldiers, it's equally or even more important to have battlefield hospitals. Because without them, untold number of soldiers would have no chance of survival in battle. I want you to try to picture that in your mind if you can. A, a, a scenario of, of combat where there are no medics, where there are no battlefield hospitals. The devastation of war just gets multiplied by an untold number. Well, you know, the church in a very real sense is like those battlefield hospitals in our battle against Satan, sometimes we're wounded, we're beaten down, we're distressed, we're hurt. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, Paul says this, we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. 
always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that his life also may be manifested in our body. There are times when we do get hurt, wounded, beaten down, distressed, and that's where the church comes into play as this hospital. So as a hospital, we help those who have physical needs, first of all. Although we don't necessarily help with physical injuries, we do help with physical needs, don't we? Turn in your Bible with me to a couple of passages. First of all, Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to see this idea in action. Begin reading with me in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And so there is a very real sense in which we as the church are to help with the physical needs, especially of our own, especially of our own people. We help with physical needs as a battlefield hospital. Now in Luke chapter 10, we won't take the time to go over there and read it, But in Luke chapter 10, we have that story that Jesus told. And it just left me. (laughs) That's what happens when you just put the verse reference and don't put what it is. Oh, goodness. Luke chapter 10. Maybe we will take time to read it. (laughs) Luke 10, beginning in verse... uh, 30. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You're familiar with the story. And he fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do you likewise. And so we see here in this story about the Good Samaritan that there were those who did not care for the physical needs of their brethren, but the one who, with whom the Father was well pleased was that Good Samaritan who indeed did that. And friends, that's what the church should do today, to help those with physical needs. And then, of course, we do help those with spiritual needs. Even that is provided by the military, isn't it? Although not necessarily in the battlefield hospitals, they provide for people's spiritual needs. In the church, this is our primary concern. What better place could there be to turn than to the church? Yes, we need to turn to Jesus, but you cannot turn to Jesus without turning to the church. You cannot separate the church from Jesus, nor can you separate Jesus from the church. It doesn't happen. And so in a real sense, when you turn to Jesus for your spiritual needs, you're turning to the church. 
And that's the way God designed it. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, as Jesus gives that familiar and famous invitation, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. He was talking about helping their spiritual needs. Did he help with people's physical needs? Certainly he did. But when he did that, it was always, so far as I know, as a buffer to lead to helping them spiritually. In Colossians chapter one, we have another example of this, showing how the church is to help with spiritual needs. Beginning in verse 24 of Colossians one, Paul there says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what was lacking on your part for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul's talking about helping people's spiritual needs through the gospel of Christ. Friends, if you have a question about the church, turn to the gospel. The Bible tells us about the church. You have questions about how we need to worship? Turn to the Bible. It, it tells us. You have questions about salvation? Turn to the Bible. That's what Paul is talking about to these Colossian brethren. That mystery which through the ages had been hidden but at that time was currently being revealed bit by bit, piece by piece, just like a puzzle. And now today that puzzle is complete and we have the whole picture right here in the word of God. So as we are on active duty in the war against Satan, let us remember that the church is the battlefield hospital where we find help in our times of need. Finally this morning, consider with me that the church is a bunker of safety. The church is a bunker of safety. Yes, it's a boot camp for soldiers. It's a battlefield hospital, but it's, it's a bunker for safety. Now, I, I got to, to thinking about a bunker and I, I knew what a bunker was, but I want to read for you a description of a bunker. It says it's a defensive military fortification designed to protect the inhabitants from falling bombs or other attacks. Bunkers are mostly below ground compared to blockhouses, which are mostly above ground. They were used extensively in World War I and World War II and the Cold War for weapons facilities, command and control centers, and storage facilities. And bunkers can also be used from protection, for protection from tornadoes. That comes from Wikipedia. You think about how a bunker functions for the military in protecting what is important, whether it be soldiers or whether it be weapons or that control and command center. That's important. The church is not only a place where we train and where we receive the help in, in different areas of our life. It's a place of safety. Friends, the church is a place of refuge. It's like a bunker for us to protect us against the attacks of Satan. I don't know about you, but for me, when I am here with you as the church, I feel like there's nothing this world can throw at me that I cannot tackle. Because I understand this is my safe place. This is my place of refuge. In this bunker, we find a few different things. Number one, encouragement from fellow soldiers. You talk about a blessing in being a, in a bunker, it would be encouragement. In our text, in Acts chapter two, we're not gonna go back and reread it, but there in Acts chapter two, we see that. Encouragement coming from their fellow Christians where they were all together nearly every day where they all had, they had all things in common, where they shared every possession that they had. You talk about a means of encouragement and that was it. But in Philippians chapter one and chapter two, we find uh, some more about this kind of encouragement that comes from our fellow Christians. Philippians one, beginning in verse 12 says, I want you to know brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. 
And so Paul is trying to encourage the Philippian brethren to not look at their trials and tribulations and persecutions as a bad thing, but to try to find the positive things that can come from it. Then drop down in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, where he says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Friends, how much time do you spend encouraging your fellow Christians? We need it. I need it. And you need it. And there's no better place to find that than in the church, this bunker of safety. Number two, in the bunker, we find a home away from home. You know, the church should really become to us a second home where there is fellowship, where there is harmony, where there's nourishment, where there's growth, and most of all, where there is love. Again, in Philippians, this time chapter one, beginning in verse 19, Paul says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or whether by death. Hmm. Listen to what he says in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What are you saying, Paul? Well, later on, he would kind of explain himself and speak to the effect that if it was God's will to leave him on the earth, that would be fine because that's beneficial for the church. But if it was God's will to take him and and to be at home with the Lord, then that was even better. But you see, the way he viewed the church was his home away from home. Finally, in the bunker, we find paternal protection. Paternal protection. You know, don't we find that in our physical homes? Paternal protection. Think about physical life. Maybe for us, sometimes our bunker is our physical home. And in that home, we find paternal protection. Well, in the church, it's the same. What better place to find the protection of a father than in the church that was purchased with the blood of his son? In John chapter 10, I encourage you to turn with me. John chapter 10. We find the greatest level of protection that we could ever find. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Jesus answered them and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep as I said to you. Now watch verse 27 and following. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater, greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You talk about a level of security and protection that we can't find anywhere else. We find it in the church. We find it in Jesus Christ. That's one of the spiritual blessings that Paul mentions in Ephesians 1 and verse 13. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ in the church. Don't misinterpret the passage to say that we'll never, ever fall from grace no matter what. That's not what Jesus is teaching. He's teaching about being in fellowship with the Father. He's teaching about His sheep who hear His voice and follow Him. And as long as that describes you, nothing can take you away from fellowship with God. So we've seen that the church is a boot camp for soldiers a battlefield hospital, and a bunker of safety. Boy, there really is a lot of benefit of being a part of the church, especially considering the serious war that is waging right now between Satan and us. 
Are you part of the army of God today? If not, the things we've talked about today will not help you. The good news is, though, that you can enlist in this army today. You can be a part of the church. We'll train you in the boot camp for soldiers. We provide this battlefield hospital and a bunker of safety. How can you enlist? The Bible tells us that we must hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. To repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confessing our faith in him, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And then being immersed for the forgiveness of sins, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. If you've not done those things today, you're not a part of God's army. We want that to be the case and we want to help you with it. Perhaps you have done those things. Maybe you're already enlisted, but you are a wall. If you've fallen away from the church, you've taken leave, it's time for you to come home. It's time for you once again to be faithful to the Lord in this battle against Satan. Friends, God loves each one of you. He wants to help you, but it must happen on his terms. And so if you need to enlist today, or if you need to come home from that leave, Come right now while we stand together and sing.